We're done with school. Over. Done. Graduated. Not really, actually. I'm not totally graduated yet. But I'm done with all my tests for everything. Yes. Honestly, AP tests were not that bad. Only studied an hour and a half for all of stats over the past two months. And I'm pretty sure I passed. I think. All right, enough about the high school work. Let's talk about high school sports and how to hype up your videos for those events. Also, I love Mambas. I'm gonna recycle these, don't worry. Like, I couldn't even fit everything into this trash can. So I'm gonna be running through the three different state, the three, 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 three. Three. The three different stages of how I make my sports videos for high school. We start with our planning, our shooting, and our editing. 14 tips. 14 tips today. Now, the first thing I can tell anyone about how to make their videos better, especially when it comes to making sport videos of live events, is go and film more. If you look back at my first video I made for a sporting event, which was the volleyball one, versus my Salem Hills basketball video, there is a huge difference because I got so much experience and I adapted to the situation so much more. So beyond anything else I'm gonna tell you today, the most important thing is to get out there and start making stuff if you want to be ready for the real projects. Not to diss on any of the sports I did before basketball, but I really wanted to make some awesome basketball videos and the ones before were some really good practice. But honestly, every single project you ever do is practice because you're always learning from everything you do. So get out there, make some stuff, whatever it is you're stoked to make, start making stuff beforehand so you have more knowledge before that thing comes. Cause you don't want like, let's say you really want to make lacrosse videos next year. You don't want lacrosse season coming along and that's the first video you're making and you're like, huh. What's Aperture, you know? Like, what do I film this in? Like, you gotta have that experience and everything dialed down, especially in your software. Get super familiar with your software and that will increase your workflow and your speed and just your overall knowledge of how to make a good video so much. That was the biggest thing that helped me this year is I'm just so familiar with Adobe Premiere Pro that I was able to not have stupid situations where I'm like, uh, why is my video cropped? Or like, uh, why is it exporting in this quality? Or, uh, why are the colors looking like this? I just got familiar with it. You just gotta know it. Otherwise, you're gonna get stuck with a lot of stupid problems and you're not gonna be able to really make the best things because you're working with stupid problems. Stupid problems suck. All right, let's jump into the planning or pre-production stage of making a hype video. Now, with any great sports highlight video comes a great song. The first thing I ever do when I'm thinking of a video to make for sports is I find a good song for it. If I don't have a song in mind, I won't know what direction I'm going in when I'm shooting things. I can't tell you how many times I've been stuck trying to find a song when I have footage for a project and it makes it so much more difficult to find the song when you have your footage. The best thing to do is to find the song beforehand so then you can film according to the song that you have so it can better match the vibe and the tone of everything you're going with and make such a more cohesive project. For instance, my Salem Hills basketball video, which I'm gonna be referencing a lot because it is definitely, I think, my best work. If I had done my Salem Hills basketball video to a much faster paced start of a song, the beginning turning rotating shots would not have fit at all. But with City of Stars by Logic, that slow movement and that opera sounding sounds fit really well with it as it jumped into the song. But I had known that beforehand, so I knew what shots I wanted at the beginning. I've got all this garbage on my feet. I just don't know where to put my feet. The microphone's right here though, so I don't want to put my feet by the mic. Hello. Okay. Ba -ba. I only have two tips for the planning and the second one is I usually start my video before I shoot my video. What I mean by that is I go into Premiere, I start my project, I lay out my song and I cut it up to the parts that I want to use. That way I can listen to that version of the song while I'm there shooting and know exactly the parts of the song I'll be using rather than just aimlessly shooting a bunch of random stuff and hoping that I get enough good stuff to just kind of 
pull something out of nowhere with, you know? Once I have the song I want to use, I start to visualize in my head the shots I want. They're never super on point of what I'm actually gonna end up doing, but they're basic things of like, where do I wanna be standing behind the bench? Where do I wanna be when I see a reaction? Where do I wanna be during like a free throw or different things like that or like cool little things like the rotation with the camera and just small little things like that, like I should throw that in there. And your visualization can never be a shot by shot sequence in your mind because it's a live event and you'll never be able to get it exactly how you want. You just need a base outline of some crowd shots you might want, some free throws, some bench shots, whatever it is that you can really control and just different angles you're thinking of doing. That way you can have it better planned out once you're there and then you can adapt to the situation and what's going on in the game. All right, so with that, let's go into our second stage, which is shooting. All right, let's talk camera settings. For the most part, I always filmed on the Lumix GH3 along with the Ronin S for my stabilizer. The reason why I love the Lumix GH3 is because it had really good autofocus when it came to the basketball games, so I never had to worry about throwing focus, especially once it's on a gimbal. You're not able to adjust focus while it's on a gimbal because you're holding it with both your hands. So good autofocus is one of the most important qualities of the camera I use. Aside from that, I filmed everything usually at 60 frames per second so I could slow it down and get some really good time ramping along with shooting at twice a shutter speed of the frames per second. So if I shot at 60 frames per second, I'm gonna wanna shoot at one over 120 shutter speed. You are shooting in 60 frames per second, but you will be exporting in a different frame rate, which I'll talk about later. Because 60 frames per second often looks way too smooth and it's not nearly as jittery. And as always, try and keep your ISO as low as possible and your aperture as low as possible as well so you get the most natural light and a really good shallow depth of field for more cinematic and good looking shots. The indoor typical uh, temperature you should be shooting at is, I don't know what it is, I think it's 32, maybe it's 5200 Kelvin. It's right here. I'm gonna look it up later. Shoot at this, or roughly around that. Either way, once you get that, you'll go home and you'll just have to make little minor adjustments. Then for focal length, I shot everything typically at 35 millimeters. If I had a tighter lens, I probably would have shot at that, but the lens that we had for the GH3 was only a 35 millimeter, but I think that was the perfect lens for it, honestly, because when I was really close to the players, when they're right there on the sideline, I could get pretty close to them without the shot being too tight, and I also could be far away, and I could still get a pretty good framing of the game and track the ball and keep the motion pretty simple and understandable because you don't wanna be shooting this at like 16 millimeter focal length because it's gonna feel way too wide and you're gonna barely be able to track the ball. It'll just look like commotion. It might even look like a live stream because it's just so wide and you're just trying to find what's going on. The video should be easy to follow. It should be easy to see where the motion's going, where the ball is going, who's shooting and what's going on. So with the gimbal, I usually shot uh, on sports mode, which is where you hold down the M on it and it allows you to move it pretty fast. So tracking was pretty simple. As I said again, get used to your equipment beforehand. You don't want to be there just first time for a project you're really excited about and not know how to use your equipment. So get used to it before you're making something you really care about. Or just go and make something anyways you really care about because you're going to learn no matter what. And as always, never shoot on auto. When you shoot on auto, you get a lot of wonky things going on that will take away from your video so much. You'll have these moments where the ISO just kind of kicks in out of nowhere and the shots will get brighter or they'll get a little bluer because the white balance is kicking in or they got, they'll get redder and just different things like that and it won't look good. You need your shots to look consistent and not be changing throughout it. So never shoot in auto. Never. Make sure you got your white balance set, your shutter speed twice your frame rate, your aperture low, and your auto focus on. Unless you're throwing focus by hand, in that case, that's fine. Go for it. So with the tighter focal length I was just talking about, this transitions to my next tip, which is probably one of the most important with shooting, is film is a close-up medium. My teacher told me that so many times, but it is so true. Especially with a video like this, where, as I said, it should be easy to follow. It's like atmospherical. You're gonna feel like you're right there in the middle of the action rather than watching a live stream. Because with a live stream, typically, you're just kind of up at the top of the bleachers, panning it around, kind of like that. You want this to feel nice and tight, almost seeing the sweat dripping off their face because that is a lot more action packed than watching it from the top of the bleachers. So keep your shots tight. Typically, the tighter the better because it'll feel like you're actually right there in the middle of the action and it'll pull them in a lot better. This part of my phone just chipped out. Like, where did that even go? 
Sad. One thing I learned pretty quick with composing a shot is the best thing for me to do was to keep moving my feet. I never wanted to be in the same spot just tracking like that. Those shots usually weren't too interesting, but if I was trucking along the sidelines or right behind the hoop, as I was moving with the action, it created this cool parallax effect, which added so much more to the shot than just standing still like I was on a tripod just panning it around. My next tip is to stay on your toes. Just as I was saying before, you can't have it set out shot by shot by shot, but if you're really good and can stay on your toes and you understand the game, you can usually get almost all the shots you want as long as they're not unrealistic and you want them to run some crazy play and it's a really hard team, blah, 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 blah. But for the most part, stay on your toes and you can get almost all the shots that you want. I've had moments where I haven't stayed on my toes and I've missed some pretty big shots. One time I was filming my boy just saying some silly stuff out in the crowd and then they started right in the beginning of quarter three and I was like, oh shoot, they're going. I saw one of their players running in for the alley-oop I'm like, shoot, I'm gonna miss it. And I just whipped it around. Horrible composition. His head was like right here on the frame, you know, like it just didn't fit. You couldn't see what was going on. Not good. I was stoked though. It was a really cool play. I just totally didn't get the shot. <laughs> And sometimes that's a lot of pressure because everybody's asking me afterwards, did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get the shot? No, I didn't get the shot. I'm sorry. I messed up, you know? So stay on your toes so you don't miss the big banger plays. I've literally had moments where like my pulse is shooting up. I'm like, oh shoot, oh shoot, here he comes. Here comes the dunk. Get ready, get ready. Stay on your toes. You'll be fine. One thing that helps me stay on my toes is I listen to the song while I'm filming. Not only does it help me stay focused on the game, but it reminds me of the type of shots I'm going for and the vibe of the whole video so I can compose my shots accordingly to that. So listening to your song helps a lot for you to stay in tune and stay focused on the game so you don't miss anything. Now my last tip for shooting is do not hesitate. Just like I was saying before with getting experience, as you get more experience, you'll hesitate less. I remember the first game that I went and filmed for volleyball, I was just kind of standing there like, ah, uh, uh, where can I go? Where can I film this? Is it okay if I go over there? Do you guys mind if I do this? Like, they won't mind. You have the camera, you look official. Don't question it. Act like you know what you're doing when you may not, because I know I definitely wasn't and I still really don't. I have a really ghetto setup here right now. You want to see it? Look at my ghetto setup. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm getting it done. I'm doing it to the best I can. So don't hesitate, get comfortable on the floor, get comfortable with the camera, so when the time comes, you're ready to just go down and do what it takes to capture the shot. Sometimes I look kind of silly when I'm shooting things with the gimbal and I'm like rotating the camera, and I'm doing the loop to loop too, like what the heck is, what, what, his shot's upside down, what is he doing? You know, they don't know. I kind of know a little bit more, so I don't worry about it because I know what I'm doing, kind of. Don't hesitate, keep it going, now. You're done, you got all your footage, you're done, you're heading home, SD card ready, big dub from the boys or the girls or whatever team you were filming. Now it's time to make the video. So let's hop on that computer for some editing. All right, the first thing I do is I look through all my footage and I sort and name every single one. Sometimes I'll sort it into different folders of like favorites, dunks, bench shots, crowd, eh, might use transitions, just like different things like that. Or what I find is best is I go through and I label each individual file for what's in it, whether it's like some of them will be named like layup, bench, crowd, cheer. So I like can just go into Premiere and I can go to my files and I can look up cheer and I'll get a couple of files with different cheers in them. I can look through them or I can be like layup and I can look through all the shots that say layup and I can find the best one. The best thing about this is once you've gone through all your footage, you will know where the best of the best shots are. You don't want to make your video and just be like, yeah, this shot kind of works right here and that shot kind of works right there. It's looking pretty good. No, you spent the time taking those shots. You want to get the best of the best out of it. You don't want to just make something minimal. You got to push yourself to that next level with your shots and with your editing so you can make something incredible, awesome. Beautiful, outstanding, hype. Push yourself to take just that extra time looking through your footage and finding the best of the best rather than just, this will work. That's not gonna cut it. So you've labeled all your footage now, it's thrown in Premiere, you're ready to go, you got your song down underneath it, it's time to start sequencing. 
One thing that I draw a big parallel to when sequencing a video is choreographing a dance. Now, I'm not a dancer. I won the Spirit Bowl dance though with my crew. Shout out to Brooke Sorensen and Kesley Heath and everyone else on there. But just like sequencing clips together and choreographing moves together, there needs to be a proper flow to it all. Otherwise, it's not gonna make sense. And it's just gonna look like a clip after clip sequence, which is not what you're making. You're making a whole video, not just putting clips next to each other. I know it sounds kind of like the same thing, but you'll get what I'm saying in a second. Think about the song that you're using. There's a flow and a build and a fall to the song, you know? Just as there should be with your sequencing. So if the beginning of your song starts out pretty mellow, you're gonna start out with some mellow shots, maybe some warm-up shots, maybe some slow-mo crowd shots, you know, kind of simple things. Kind of like in my Tim versus Salem Hills basketball video, the beginning was a really slow, rotating multiple shots that flowed together until the first drop hit, which is where the first shot came in. It needs, it choreographs and flows together rather than just being like, ooh, let's put all these really cool shots next to each other. They're gonna mean a little bit more between it all. One of the things that I do typically is I find that one shot, the climax of the whole video, you know, like my favorite part, and I make that first, and then I build around it. Again, referencing my Tim vs. Salem Hills basketball video, it was that first dunk in the video that was like, okay, this is what I'm building it around. So I sequenced that in, and then I just had to build kind of around it. So at this point, you've gone through your footage, you've labeled it all, you've maybe sequenced out like your favorite parts, you know, the spots that you really want to get right. You're probably pretty drained. So what I would say for my next tip is take a break. A lot of times you can get really creatively drained if you're just out there pounding out a video five or six hours straight that you just kind of get this tunnel vision and you're not really seeing what you're making anymore. So I usually take one to two breaks, usually between sorting footage and then after sequencing. So then I can come back with a fresh creative mindset and I can either be like, no, this clip doesn't work here or yeah, here's how I'm gonna transition these shots and really get that polished final creative look over it all. So regarding the polishing of your video, there's three things that are really important. Color grading, sound design, and exporting. So let's talk color grading. You can look at a bunch of other color grading tutorials and you can just see how to get familiar with it, which I highly recommend. Get used to it, know how to work the Lumetri color panel. But if you're making it look wonky and a little weird and it doesn't look natural, that's gonna take away from your video a lot. One thing I recommend using is either the scopes or just really lightly color grading at first. The first color grading I did in my few videos were pretty light. And then I had some where I maybe did a little over the top and it kind of didn't look so good. Color grading should look natural to an extent. It's more about stylizing your video to give it an overarching tone rather than just going crazy with the filter, you know? Color grading should add to the vibe of your video. Just like how you might use black and white shots at the beginning of the buildup and it slowly rises, you know, and that's when the color hits in. Like in one of Noah Simmons basketball videos against Bingham. That was a really good example of using color grading to convey a meaning behind it. As long as you're shooting in the right white balance at first, you won't have to make that many corrections and the color grading process will be pretty easy. And you won't have to be salvaging your footage by like going crazy, making it way more cooler, way warmer, so it just doesn't look gross and unnatural. Cause like I said, a lot of times you can get sucked into this tunnel vision and you don't see how magenta your videos are. And you're just like, oh wow, that's really magenta once you come back to it a week later and you're like, well crap. So don't do that. Fresh eyes and use your scales. If you use your scales, they're way more trustworthy than your eyes and you can really see, okay, this is balanced out correctly. Look up a tutorial on how to understand scales cause I don't really wanna talk about it. Next, sound design. Sound design is the biggest part of polishing your video. I won an award for my Salem Hills vs. Temp basketball video and one of the reasons why I think I got that Honestly, like the reason why I think I won it over the others, because the other ones were incredible. But I think it's because of my sound design. Sound design is often totally overlooked. But let me show you an example of a basketball video without sound design, and let me show you one with sound design.
first one feels empty almost, you know? You're just watching clips with a song underneath it. But the other one, it's enthralling, it's gripping, it's atmospherical, you know? You're really transported right there into the game because you have the crowd cheering behind you. We have the players yelling, you have the three announcement going off, you know? And different things like that. It feels way more like you're right there in the action. I recommend using whooshes for transition, swish sounds for the basketball when it goes in, lots of crowd noises, lots of announcements, different things like that. Obviously not overpowering your song, but adding to the flow. Last tip, your first export will never be your last export. Maybe, maybe one time it will. Most likely it will not. Whenever I export a video, I upload it to my drive, I watch it on my phone, I watch it on my phone in my car, maybe I watch it on my computer later, but I watch it in these different scenarios rather than just where I've been sitting with my tunnel vision again so I can see it again with different eyes. So maybe I'll look at it and I'll be like, hmm, I don't know if that shot really worked right there or a lot of times I'll hear things. I'll be like, ooh, that sound design right there was way too loud. I need to turn down the crowd or oh, I need to turn up that noise right there. And there's a lot of little things that you need to do just by watching it over and over but in different situations so you get out of your tunnel vision. You're gonna wanna export it typically at 30 to 24 frames per second. I usually export it at 30 frames per second just because when you export it at 24 frames per second and some shots are still in 60p with a 1 over 120 shutter speed, it looks too jittery. It looks like it's choppy, you know? It doesn't work. But with a 30 frames per second, it adds more energy to it, more movement. When it's overly smooth, it looks kind of lethargic almost. You know, it looks slower. It looks like it's not moving nearly as well. So typically I export in 30 frames per second, which adds a little bit more energy to it. All right, that's about it. You've exported your video, you upload it to YouTube, you show it on T-Wolf TV or whatever school TV things you have, and boom, you're hyping up the school, you're hyping up the sports, and everybody loves it. Honestly, making sports videos for the school is so fun because it adds that extra bit of community and a bit of like, you know, love for the sport and way more hype behind it. So get out there, go find that song that you're dying to use, Go practice some videos beforehand so then you can go out there, make a dope volleyball video, a tennis video, a golf video, soccer, football, basketball, swim, dance, ballroom, choir, anything, anything at the high school can and should be hyped. It's our job as videographers to get out there and showcase these people and make them look just as good as they really are. Anyways. I've been working a lot on videos lately. If you haven't seen, I just recently made a music video from a boy, Christian Christensen. It's on his channel. Go check it out. Drop a comment asking me a question about how I made it, how I did different effects, and I will make a tutorial about how I made that video. Not step by step necessarily, but talking about the most difficult things to a lot of effects that people might not know how to do. Go check it out. Give him some support. Like and subscribe to me or whatever the heck you want. I don't really care. I'm just doing this for fun and kind of help out all my people back there at Tim and wherever you may be to make some dope videos. Ah, what a good time. All right, that's it for my high school content, I'm pretty sure. I'm gonna be uploading more stuff here. I'm doing other work, but you boys graduated. It's been real, see you guys.